Amen. I'm excited this morning. If you'll turn with me uh, to John 17. John 17, and I've called this the, the prayer of all prayers. What we have in John 17 is probably one of the most precious gifts that is given to us in all the Scripture. Some refer to it as the inner sanctum of Holy Scripture or the holy of holies of the Bible. Because this is where you get to see Jesus, our intercessor, intercede for us. Jesus, the mediator, mediate for us. The one who established the ability to pray, pray for us. If that doesn't get you excited already, just let it sit with you for a few minutes this morning, what we get to read in these 26 verses in John 17. It would be like sitting there with J.R.R. Tolkien and have him tell you a story instead of reading The Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit. That's who wrote those, by the way, if you didn't know. I left the J off in the first service, but you get it. It would be like being in the backyard playing catch with Troy Aikman rather than just watching him on TV. We get an opportunity to see Jesus read about it and, and experience his prayer for us. And this passage of scripture, we have 26 verses that most pastors take in at least three sermons. I've seen some pastors do dozens of sermons from this one chapter. I'm going to attempt to do it in one sermon. Not to impress you, but because I believe it's one prayer. And there's some benefit for you to see this prayer as a whole. Also, for those of you who have endured the journey thus far, it's a bit of a payoff. And I mean the journey of walking through the Gospel of John. Being here dedicated, steadfast every week with your pen and notepad in hand, ready to digest God's Word. We're already at John 17. And what you see in John 17, as D.A. Carson notices, is basically a summary of of all that John's recorded to this point. He notes that in these, this one verse, I mean, in this one chapter, these 26 verses, the principal themes of this prayer include things that we've already seen, like Jesus' obedience to his Father. It's been a theme throughout the Gospel of John. The glorification of his Father through his own death, exaltation, and ascension. The revelation of God in Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of Jesus coming all throughout the Gospel of John. We've seen that. The choosing of the disciples out of the world. We've already seen that. But yet also the mission of the disciples sent back into the world. How their unity as disciples, our unity as disciples, is modeled by the unity between Jesus and God as reflected between us and the Son. And their final destiny being in the presence of the Father and the Son in heaven, and that final destiny being guaranteed. All of these things we've already seen, and Jesus prays all of those things in this one chapter. So I pray that you would savor every morsel of what we get to dine on this morning. Let's jump right into it. I want to break it into two major sections. It can be broken down even more, but just for the framework of getting through it in one week, I want to break it down into two sections. Number one, Jesus prays for himself in verses 1 through 5, and then Jesus prays for his disciples in verses 6 through 26. Both the local disciples, meaning the 12, but that also extends to us his future disciples. So Jesus prays for himself, and then he prays for his disciples. And the first thing that we see as he's praying for himself is he prays for his self-glorification. Look at verses 1 through 5. Before we get into how he literally prayed for his own glory to be revealed, you need to understand a little bit about what glory means. What does the term to be glorified mean? Basically, it means to make somebody's name famous to others. Now, this can happen on your own. You, you can go through great effort to try to make your name famous in front of other people. We spend most of our time doing that in our society today. Or it can be you trying to make somebody else's inner character known to a group of people so that their name is made famous, so that they are high and lifted up. Jesus does both of these things in this passage of Scripture. He, he makes his name glorified or magnified and his character revealed, but also in revealing his character and his glorification, he is bringing glory to the Father. And just in case you think that self-glorification is selfish, look at verse 1. You need to understand the context of Jesus praying for his own glorification. He says here, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son. Why? 
that the Son may glorify you. Even in his self-glorification prayer, he is praying that God's name would be lifted high, that God's name would be exalted, that God would be glorified through his glorification. So it's not selfish. And I also agree with Kent Hughes, who breaks Jesus' prayer for glorification into three digestible segments. Number one, he prays for his glorification in the cross, which is next on his to-do list. Then he prays for his glorification among his people. We call that the church. And then he prays to be glorified in heaven. Let's start with Jesus' prayer to be glorified on the cross. We see this in verse 1, and we also see this in verse 4. The process of the glorification of the Son of God is a three-step process. Just like last week when Jesus said, I've overcome the world, we looked at the gift of overcoming the world, I said to you that was also a three-step process. Step number one was Jesus living a perfect life. That is almost all but accomplished at this point. And he recognizes that in verse 4. He says, I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Jesus accomplished a lot. One of the main things that he accomplished was living this perfect life for us that we could not do. Now, in John 17, Jesus is facing the next step, which is his glorification through death and suffering. His glorification through the cross. And then, after the cross, the final step of his glorification will be the resurrection, ascension into heaven, in which he will continue to be glorified for all of eternity. But first, Jesus must face the cross. And he's praying to his Father. It's this time, Lord. It's time is now for me to suffer, to be brutalized, and to die. And in this, I will be glorified. And in this, you will be glorified. How does Jesus glorify the Father in the cross? By revealing God's character to us. No better place will you ever find that reveals the character and the nature of God than the cross. This is Jesus' job on this earth, to reveal God's character to you, to make God known to you. Is that not what he said in John chapter 1, verse 18? He says, John records earlier, very early in this book, no one has seen God at any time. You can't just go find him. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, that's Jesus, he has explained him to you. What John is saying there is that this, this is what Jesus did. He explained God to us. Another word you can use there is exegete. Jesus exegeted God to us. This is what I'm trying to do in John 17. I'm exegeting this passage of scripture. I'm breaking it down and trying to explain it to you so you can understand it. This is how you understand God. Jesus broke him down for you. And no better place is God explained to you than on the cross. This is how Jesus was glorified so you could see God on the cross. What do I mean by that? Well, on the cross, you see God's passion for his glory revealed. You see God's hatred of sin juxtaposed with his love for justice and love for man. God's hatred for sin was displayed when he poured his wrath on the cross on Jesus. That's God's wrath and hatred towards sin. But at the same time, it's also his love for justice. And his love for you is displayed in that he poured out his wrath on Jesus rather than pouring it out on you for all of eternity, if you would believe. On the cross, you see the dual nature of the Godhead, his uncompromising justice and his unending love. When you see God pour out his wrath on the Son, what you must realize if you bask in the glory of that truth is that God's love for you is unending. He paid the ultimate price of anyone who was willing to ever pay anything. He allowed Jesus, his only Son, to take your place. What greater measure of love can you think of than that? But yet at the same time, have you ever known such hatred for sin than to brutalize and to crush the innocent, sinless Son of God? If you want to understand God, peer deeply at the cross. In fact, the deeper your understanding of the cross will be your deeper understanding of God because his character in Christ is most revealed at the cross. 
So Jesus was glorified on the cross so that God's name could be made known. But Jesus not only prays to be glorified in the cross, Jesus also prays to be glorified among his people. Look at verses 2 through 3. This is his church. This consumes the majority of the prayer of Jesus praying to be glorified. He says here in verse 2, even as you have Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, he's talking about himself, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. And then in verse 3, he does you a great favor. Jesus explains eternal life to you. This is eternal life. Underline this word. That they may know you. Circle it, star it, highlight it. Know this word, know. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Church, Jesus is glorified as he reveals himself through his people. Who are his people? His people are the ones whom he's given eternal life to. Who has Jesus given eternal life to? The answer is here. Those who know God. Those who know Jesus. This term know, K-N-O-W, is the key to understanding this passage, specifically in this verse. And it's also the key... For you understanding eternal life. This term no goes far beyond rudimentary facts and into an intimate knowledge of, an intimate relationship with. In fact, this word no, K-N-O-W, often describes the nature of a relationship between a man and a woman. If you've ever been in a serious relationship or if you've ever been married, you know what Jesus is trying to say here. This kind of relationship that he is describing. See, in a marriage... Your relationship goes far beyond facts about each other. No, you what? You know each other. This intimacy intimacy is expressed, and you're all going to giggle here, but it's okay. It's expressed in your sexual relationship. It's expressed in your emotional relationship. It's expressed in your spiritual relationship. It's expressed in all aspects of your relationship. That's why the Bible says when you're married, you are one flesh. Couples who truly know each other, they anticipate each other's needs. Why? Because they desire for the other person to be happy. In fact, they know each other. Sometimes couples who've been together long enough can do what? They can finish each other's sentences. Sometimes they even act like each other. There's some grandparents in here. Probably not very many, though. But if if you know some grandparents, observe them. A couple that's married married like 50 years and see if they don't act like each other sometimes. And what's even more scary yet, what do people say? I don't know if it's true or not. What do people say about couples who've been together a long, long time? Yeah, I'm not the only one that says this, right? They begin to even look like each other. Now, so for some of you guys, that's good. And for some of you ladies, that's bad. (laughs) But it is what it is. The more time you spend together, the more intimate your knowledge will be of one another. This is describing the nature of what it means to have eternal life. I don't care how many fact quizzes you can complete on Facebook. You can get 100% on all of them and still not know Jesus. Are you growing in your relationship with Jesus? Do you anticipate his will being done in your life because your sole focus is to please your Savior and your King? This is how you know you have eternal life. Do you know Christ? And the more you know Christ, I don't know if it's true in couples, but it's true with Jesus, the more you'll begin to do what? To look like him. This is what glorifies Christ in the life of the church when we look like him. Because when we look like him, people will see him in us And when they see him in us, he gets the glory because we can therefore tell them about him. If you do anything in 2018, please fulfill this prayer that the Lord Jesus Christ would be glorified in your life because when people see you, the more they look at you, the more they see him. This will only happen through an intimate relationship with him, not just by coming to church, not just by reading a book about Jesus, but by spending time with him in prayer, by talking to him through spirit, by being dedicated to his word. Not only pray that he, 
He not only prays that he'll be glorified among his people, the church, be glorified on the cross, he also prays for his glory in heaven. Look at verse 5. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Oh, there's a lot of good spiritual truth here. We don't have time to digest it all. But simply saying, Jesus is recounting the reality that he is God. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was God and Jesus was the word with God and he was God and he will always be God. Jesus says, I am going back to that relationship like I had with you before I came to this earth. But then when he goes back, it won't be exactly like he had before. Why? Because never again will our Messiah be without his human name, Jesus. He ascended in the heaven in his glorified body and he will always be fully God and fully man in heaven for all of eternity. See, Pastor, my head's starting to hurt. That's okay. Let Paul explain it to you if I'm not getting it right. Philippians 2, 7 says, he, meaning Jesus Christ, emptied himself when he came to this earth and he took on the form of a bondservant being made in the likeness of a man and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Verse 9 is when the glorification kicks in. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name which is above every name. That at the name of what? Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in earth and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The heavenly glorification process for Jesus started post-cross. It started post-resurrection. It happened in his ascension and the glorification of Jesus in heaven. This prayer that he prayed will continue to be answered for all of eternity. It's important for you to grasp the glorification of Jesus in heaven because it will put him in his proper place in your life, high and lifted up. It will enable you to trust him more and it will help you to worship him better. See, understanding the glorification of Jesus on the cross and the glorification of Jesus in heaven will help you participate in his glorification in your life while on this earth. Say it again, Pastor. Okay, the glorification of Jesus on the cross happened then, 2,000 years ago. That time is over. You take that information with you. The glorification of Jesus in heaven is occurring now, but you won't get to experience it until you die and go to heaven. You're here. And every single one of you who have gathered in here today, if you believe, have a role to play in the glorification of God the Son, Jesus Christ, on this earth. Your objective in 2018 as you reflect his glory should be, what does that look like? How do I participate in his glory being shown through me this year? This is Jesus praying for himself. The more you look like him, the more you can point them to him. It reminds me of a story by a man named Nathaniel Hawthorne. He wrote a story called The Great Stone Face. And in the story, there's a young boy who lived at the base of a mountain. And on the mountain was starved, in, uh, starved, carved into stone a stone face that reflected a human face. And the legend goes that one day a man will come who has the face like the stone face, and he'll bring blessing and prosperity to the village. This got the young boy excited, so he'd often go not only to the base of the mountain, but go up on the mountain, and he would sit and bask in the glory of this carved face for hours, waiting to be able to see that stone face on a man in his village, because then he would know the blessing would be there. The man never came as this child was a boy, but soon the boy became a man, and as a young man, he continued to go. Yet there was no one that looked like the stone face. This young man became a middle-aged man. He would still spend hours waiting for the legend to happen, but didn't come when he was a young man. Finally, as an old man, in his dying years, he had just finished spending hours staring at the stone face, and this old man came back into the village, and a young villager said, Aha, look! There he is, the one who has the stone face. You know what happened to that man? He spent so much time waiting on him, 
he began to look like him. This is how Christ should be glorified in your life. The more time you spend with him, not the stone face, the more time you spend with Christ and waiting for him to come, the more you will get to know him and the more you will look like him and the more the world will see him in you. What a goal for 2018. Jesus prays for himself, but then look at verses 6 through 26. He also prays for his disciples. In verses 6 through 11, Jesus here is describing the nature of his relationship with his 12 disciples. And he's basically confessing this to God. God, I've come. I've accomplished your mission, he says in verse 4. In verses 6 through 11, he says, your mission for me to pass on what you want them to know, I've done it. Everything you've given me, I've given to them. But then Jesus knows he's about to leave them. So what does he do? He prays for them. And starting in verse 11 through verse 26, we see the actual prayer of Jesus for his disciples, the first 12. But then it also crosses over to all his future disciples, which includes you and me. Let's let's look at it together. He prays for unity among believers. He prays for proper relationship among believers with the world. And he prays for his disciples to have an eternal victory. Let's start with unity, verses 11 through 13 and verses 20 through 23. Both of these sections are Jesus' prayer for unity among his disciples, unity among believers. Look at verse 11. Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one as we are. That's for the 12. But he quickly moves from the 12 and then into verse 20. This includes you and me. How would I know? Because he says it. He says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, so not just the 12, but for those who believe in me through their word. That's us. The only reason we believe here today is because those who first believed, the first 12 disciples, passed on what they believed about Jesus, and they passed it on, and they passed it on, and they passed it on. So it eventually got on a boat, and they came over here, we call it America, and it's been passed on to us. So these next verses apply to us, verse 21, that they may be one. Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, so that they may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, and they may be one just as we are one. In them, I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity. It's a beautiful poem, isn't it? So that the world may know, there's that word again, that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. This is the prayer of unity for the disciples of Christ, starting with those first few and moves to us. And the unity he wants for us must reflect the nature of the unity that occurs in the God hand between Jesus and God the Father. You say, Pastor, it's a lot to digest. After all, unity is kind of a broad term. Does this just mean we'd be nice to each other? No, no, no. Jesus has something specific in mind. Look at the results that he wants from the unity, and this will show you what we must be unified about. Go to verse 21 and verse 23. Jesus gives you the purpose with what we call in Greek a a hena clause. It means uh, Jesus says this in order to accomplish this. In verse 21, he prays for our unity to reflect the nature of God And the Son, why? So that the world may believe that you sent me. Look at verse 23. He prays for unity again. So that the world may know that you sent me. Church, Jesus wants the unity of his disciples then and the unity of all his future disciples to be focused on what matters the most. What we celebrated today in the Lord's Supper What matters the most is reaching the world for Jesus Christ, that they may believe in him, that God sent him to save us, and that they may know him. Everything else needs to take its place below that. We need to have a laser focus in reaching reaching the world for Jesus Christ. This is what we must have unity in. We must seek unity for the sake of, of reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to try to explain to you the importance of this because I see so much disunity in our church, maybe not so much here, but I see it here, but especially among our churches. 
Yes, there are reasons to disfellowship with other believers if they are not believers. And what they do believe or they don't believe about the Godhead, about Jesus Christ. Because if you look here at verse 11, this unity that we have in reaching the world of Jesus Christ, it also has to do with the name of God. And the name of God is representative of the attributes of God. So yes, there are valid reasons for separating with other churches or other people who claim to be believers because of some heretical view on God, the Godhead, or Jesus Christ, or the gospel in which we're supposed to preach. But these issues, what we believe about them, as revealed in the Word of God, was settled a long, long time ago. You can read the Apostles' Creed. You can read the Nicene Creed. These are the things that we have to be unified on with the laser focus of reaching the lost. But I want to tell you today, the majority of what separates believers are not the critical issues. It's personal preferences, piddly minor preferences. This brings disunity to the church. One of the reasons that this happens is because we have a spirit of competition. I think this is what it means to be an American, to be competitive and to win. We like winning. I get that. But why are we competitive with other Christian churches? That makes no sense. But even I can find myself feeling this way as well. When we put this competition above the priority, we bring disunity to the universal church of Christ. And it actually, instead of helping people come to know Jesus, it has the opposite effect of what Jesus was praying for in John 17. In fact, disunity among the believers of Jesus Christ prevents us from reaching people for Christ. But it gets worse. We have disunity even among our churches. We tend to disagree on secondary issues like musical preference, personal satisfaction in the church or how the church makes us feel. I say it all the time, we're a consumer-driven church society. We, we treat church like Burger King. If I don't have it my way, I'm going to go somewhere else where I can have it my way. I've seen so many people leave the church over preference when much more important issues like the doctrine of God, the divine nature of Jesus Christ are almost completely ignored. And it hurts me. But this is what Jesus is talking about, so we're going to talk about it. Some of these things I'm going to say are going to be pointed. They're not meant to hurt you. They're meant to bring unity among you because we've got to do something about not reaching the world for Jesus Christ. And I think disunity and disharmony is at the top of the list. I hear people say, I just don't feel it anymore. What does that mean? I hear people say, the music doesn't touch me. What are you talking about? I hear people say that it doesn't sound like it did when I was a child or it doesn't sound like the way that I want it to sound or this, this color or this formation or this preference all the time. And then people like disfellowship over these things. They go look for other churches over these things. And I'm like, are you kidding me? There's only one word that I can think of to describe this this week. And I had to apply it to myself too, so don't let it offend you too much. Or let it offend you. It may help you. Immaturity. It's the only conclusion I can come to that allows for such piddly preferences to separate the church of Jesus Christ. I also believe disunity occurs not just because of competition, because of immaturity, but because it can. So, Pastor, what do you mean by that? When you live in a nation like America, many of the believers here can become complacent and spoiled. It reminds me of a child that gets everything that they want at Christmas. Yes, because I believe immaturity is often reflective of a childlike attitude. Your children at Christmas, if they get everything that they want, all of a sudden there's nothing that they do want. And you notice over time, if you continue to let them bask in this spoiled nature, they'll become ungrateful and unappreciative. And though they have everything, what will they become? They'll become dissatisfied with everything. You're like, what? How can this happen? You got everything that you wanted, yet you sit here and you pout and you moan all day long. Notice you never see children in third world country complain and become ungrateful about what they have. 
Just like you don't see persecuted Christian churches separate over preference. Why? Because they're worried about survival. When you're worried about survival, you tend to not care about the preference as much as the laser focus on what matters the most, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the attributes of God, and his greatness. Your immaturity is directly related to how much time you spend with Jesus. Because the more time you spend with Jesus in his holy word, basking in the presence of the Spirit, Through true, non-selfish, God-glorifying prayer, the greater God's glory will become to you, and the greater God's glory becomes to you as it's revealed in the gospel. All of these piddly preferences will be put in their place, and they will become secondary. But the more you become disenchanted in your spoiled nature, yet you combine that with not spending time with God, your preferences will start to rise on the same level as the gospel and what matters most to God. And this distracts us from sharing the gospel. I've seen so many people in so many churches get so distracted on their preferences that they don't even accomplish the major commands of God. And if we're not accomplishing the great commandments and the great commission, how do we even call ourselves a church? This is not just pointed at you, although I want you to take the personal application. It's pointed at us as an American Christian church. This type of disunified attitude grows in an individual that doesn't spend time with Christ. Please don't miss that. Now, once you become mature, you might just leave a church over doctrinal issues. And that's fine. Or because you move or some other reason that's not immature. But never again will you leave a church over piddly preferences. Or will you cause disunity in a church over piddly preferences? Why? Because the church is strongest when unity is greatest. What we tell people when we're disunified, when we're not unified is we tell them unity doesn't matter. When Jesus says here, unity matters big time because the unity that's reflected in the church reflects the unity between Jesus and God himself. The more we grow in Christ, the closer we get to him. This is a fact. The closer we grow in Christ, the closer we will grow with each other. And the closer we grow with one another, the less the secondary issues will be able to separate us. But let me tell you what Satan wants. He wants you to stay focused on you. Oh, Satan wants you to stay dissatisfied. He does not want us to be unified. Because see, when we're separated over the minor issues, like how we feel or preferences on function or colors or, I don't know, 10,000 other things, We'll never come together on major issues like reaching the world for Jesus and raising the next generation of passionate followers of Christ. That's bad news. Let me give you some good news. The result of unity in verse 13 is joy. Look what it says here. Joy is the result of unity. I see so many people dissatisfied in church looking for joy or or leaving and do church hopping looking for joy, but they never find it. When joy is waiting for you, if you just seek unity in the church body that God has called you to in the community that he's helped you to be a part of. So I got questions for you today. Which describes you? Are you full of joy? Are you full of dissatisfaction? Another way to put it is, are you fulfilling the Great Commission? Are you too worried about what you want that's not being accomplished in your life? I guess what I'm really asking is, are you mature or are you immature? What Jesus needs are mature followers of Christ to reach the world. That's what he prays for here. Look at verses 14 through 19. Jesus not only prays for unity among disciples, that's us. He also prays for them to have a proper relationship with the world. And your unity with each other will help you have a proper relationship with the world because you'll have help. Jesus says the proper relationship among believers is unity. The proper relationship between believers in the world is balanced. That's what he says in verses 14 through 18. I have given them your word and the word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now, Father, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but keep them there, but keep them from the evil one. 
They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. In verse 18, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world as well. Jesus says here that he has not prepared us for isolation, nor has he, has he prepared us for complete assimilation either. What do I mean by that? Jesus did not create you and send you into this world so you could create your own Christian community apart from the world. Nor did he send you into this world to assimilate, to look like, smell like, and act like the world either. You say, well, pastor, if I can't live separate from the world and, and I'm not supposed to look like the world, then what am I supposed to do? The hard thing. Jesus sent you this world on mission. To live in the world amongst the lost in the world with a focus to reach them for Jesus Christ without becoming like them. Unfortunately, we tend to be polarized and lean towards one or the other. There are many that say, well, I want to be isolated from the world. I just want to have Christian friends and I want to be in a Christian community. So I'm going to go to church. And I'm going to go home and I'm going to stay away from these wicked people in this world. And then when I have children, I'm going to keep them separate from the world any and every way which I can. And then we're going to live here in our little commune separated from the world. That sounds good. And you might think you're growing to maturity, but Jesus never did that. That's not the example he left you. Nor would he ever call you to do that either. He lived with the world, reaching the world. Yet the other tendency we have in our homes and even in our churches is to say, well, I want to bring the world to my home. I want to bring the world to our church so that we don't do anything that offends the world. Well, that's good. It's, that's kind of a missional mindset. But the problem with if you do that completely and you assimilate with the world 100%, then they won't see the difference between them and you. Not only will they not see the difference between them and you, they won't see the difference between Jesus, their God, and your Jesus. There must be a difference. We live in the world with a wish and a mindset, abiding in Christ for the sake of reaching them for him. Balance is what Jesus is praying for here. He says, Father, I don't want you to take them from the world. I want you to protect them from the evil one while they're on mission. Yet, I don't want them to look just like the world either. I want them to reflect my nature. You know what is a reminder for me that is an example of this? Upward basketball. Think about it. Upward basketball is not Christian basketball. Right? We don't make up our own rules. I mean, we do little things that are different, but it's competitive basketball that has a laser focus of bringing the community to us to reach them for Jesus. So my question for you today in 2018 is how do you find that balance? As you're looking like Jesus and you're growing in him, let's just assume you're going to do all that. And the preferences become secondary. The glory becomes first. You're looking more like Jesus. How do you find balance with the world that you live in? Maybe for you, it's joining some kind of community activity or a community group. Maybe for you, it's having your children participate in like community sporting leagues. Like, oh, what? Well, okay, it may not work for you, but it might work for you. With the focus of your children who love Jesus being around the children who don't know Jesus. With the focus of you as a parent who loves Jesus and is seeking him daily to be around parents that don't share the faith with you. Maybe for you it's to being on like a school board or a school activity, a PTA, or maybe it's a community committee. There's lots to be involved in. But being a part of groups, reflecting the nature of Christ with those who do not share your same faith, that will help you find balance. So Jesus prays, for his disciples to be unified, he prays that they find balance or a proper relationship with the world. And finally, in verses 26, I mean 24 through 26, Jesus prays for his disciples to have and he even guarantees eternal victory. Look at verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me will be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Here, Jesus prays that his disciples would be with him and to see his glory, the glory that existed before time began. This can only happen in a place called heaven, and you're only going to have heaven and eternal life if you truly believe. The question is, do you truly believe? Do you know Christ? If not, it's not complicated. I'm not saying it's going to be easy for you, but it's not complicated. What you must do right now is repent of your sin and the life that you've been living for yourself. And follow Jesus 
Believe in him and his sacrifice. Believe in him and his resurrection. Believe in him and his glorification so that you can have forgiveness of your sin. Follow him instead of the world. Desire to please him and bring him glory above the world. That's what it means to believe. But if you're a believer here today, there's also fantastic news for you. Look at verse 26. He guarantees your eternal victory with a eternal guarantee. I have made your name known to them and will make it known, meaning continually, so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. Church, take courage if you're a believer because you will never be alone. Take comfort if you're a believer because the love of Christ will always be with you because Christ will always remain in you to guide you and to comfort your weary soul. Well, we did it. 26 verses. What a prayer. Here's your job. This is, this is so personal. That's what I love about this prayer. What did Jesus pray for you specifically you, to be accomplished in your life in these 26 verses that is not being accomplished right now. You want to make some New Year's resolutions? Lose some weight, stop smoking, stop drinking. Those are good, but not near as good as this. Make a New Year's resolution that has where you're lacking where you grow in in 2018. If you just kind of have a spirit of disunity, Pray to Christ to help you see what matters. Be laser focused on what matters and push your personal preferences aside for the sake of reaching the world. Maybe you've never seen glorif Jesus glorified on the cross or in heaven and you need to have that proper perspective of him high and lifted up. Maybe you've had an improper relationship with the world and you need to establish some boundaries so you can have balance. I don't know what it is, but do what you're lacking in 2018. Make that your focus. And then try praying like this. We're going to look at the example prayer starting next week as we have a season of prayer together. And this is not the example prayer, but it's an example prayer. You may not be facing the cross, but you're probably facing some kind of hardship this year. Pray that God would be glorified in your hardship. You may not have the 12 disciples, but you're discipling somebody. Pray for your disciples like Jesus prayed for his. Pray for unity in your home. Pray for unity in your church. Pray for unity among the disciples that you have influence with. Pray these type of things for those who you know and love. What a great passage.